misinformation. Learn, listen, seek the face of the Holy Spirit. Okay? To help you understand, absorb, and live it out and present the facts clearly. Three views. Are we ready? Three views. Class is beginning. You guys are going to have to wait. With your questions, you're going to wait. It's going to be a while. View number one, the sons of God are angels. View number two, the sons of God are the descendants of Adam through Seth, the Sethites. In contrast to the corrupt seed of Cain, who is of the devil. That's view number two. View number three, view number three, the sons of God, that title refers to human rulers who thought they were gods on earth, divinities, because you'll find a common motif in ancient Near Eastern cultures. This is common, where the human king was believed to be a divine hybrid, so to speak, that he was sired by a god or goddess through a human consort. You guys know this, right? For example, if you read the Enuma Elish or the epics of Gilgamesh, you'll note that these ancient kings, the Sumerian kings, the Babylonian kings, the Assyrian kings, the Egyptian kings, with the exception of the Israelite kings, they believed that their rulers were hybrids, semi-divine, semi-human, right? Divine and human. I won't say fully divine, fully human, but they were a hybrid. Because one of their parents was a god or goddess, and their other parent was a human being. So either a god sired a woman to give birth to an offspring that was a hybrid, partially divine, partially human, or a goddess would sleep with a human being, get pregnant by that man, and give birth to their offspring. And that was the belief in regards to Gelgemish. Gelgemish is believed to have been the fifth king of Uruk after the flood. Now, guys, it's been a long time since I've read the epics of Gelgemish, the epic of Gelgemish. It's been a long time. I'm trusting Holy Spirit to save me from error and perfect my ability. Please, Holy Spirit, to recall facts clearly, interpret them correctly, and save me from stammering to glorify Christ. I used to think it was the king of Ur, but if my memory doesn't fail me, it was called Uruk, U-R-U-K, which, if my memory doesn't fail me, would be the same place as Ur of the Chaldees from which Abraham came out. He was the fifth king after the flood. Can you guys Google it? The greatest scholar who ever lived. Google. Gilgamesh, the fifth king of Uruk. His mother was the goddess Ninirga. And his father was her priest. So they believe Gilgamesh was divine and human, a human father and a divine mother, a goddess. Right? And he was the friend of Ankido. I remember reading that story in the 90s. Fascinating story. Right? Now, I have no reason to deny the existence of Gilgamesh. I have no reason to deny he's an historical king and that these are historical events that became embellished and these acts were attributed to gods and goddesses who are actually demons. Thank you. So glory to the Holy Spirit for enabling me to recall facts perfectly. I pray he keeps perfecting these gifts. I use them to glorify Christ and build you up. Okay. So there is a view that says in Genesis 6, verses 1 to 4, those sons of God, sons of God, would actually be these rulers who in their arrogance thought they were mighty gods on earth because they may have been sired by the gods. Or goddesses. Now, some wouldn't say that these are the hybrid offspring of divine beings sleeping with women, because then we end up with the same dilemma that spirit creatures impregnate women. But they would say that the sons of God here refers to human rulers who, in their arrogance, thought they were divine. So let me repeat what this position is saying and is not saying. Among Christians, there's the view that the sons of God of Genesis 6 refer to human rulers who are not sired by gods or goddesses cohabiting with human beings. 
But in their arrogance, that's what they thought. That's what they claim. You get it? In their arrogance, that's what they thought. That's what they claimed. Focus, guys. Don't engage in debate in the comment section because you're going to rob yourself of listening and learning. So what are the three views? Let me repeat the three views. Sons of God refers to the angels, number one. No, Ryan, that's not what it's called. It's different. Second view. Sons of God refer to the seed of Adam through Seth, the righteous line of Adam through Seth, the Sethites, in contrast to Cain, whose seed had been tainted and corrupted. Okay? That's the second view. So the descendants of Seth slept with the daughters of Cain and his seed. The believers marrying unbelievers. That's the second view. The third view is, these are human rulers who thought they were divine beings, sons of God, right? Even though these are what we call illusions of grandeur, right? This is just claims devoid of any reality. So I know the views. So why do I still believe they're angels? Well, because I see the evidence internally, contextually, and historically to point to the angels. Now, with that said, let me repeat. Let me repeat. Yep, exerces. The Babylonian kings, the Persian kings, the Egyptian kings, the Assyrian kings, Roman, they all thought they were gods and goddesses. They all thought that. Now, why would they think this? Let me repeat something about myth. And here's where people think that myth means simply fairy tales and falsehoods that have no historical basis. That's not what a myth is. Myth starts off as an historical event. Hear me out, guys. Historical event. An event that takes place. And it is remembered by those who were eyewitnesses to the event. And as they pass on the details of that event through subsequent generations, that event becomes embellished, right? Enlarged, right? Enlarged. So that you start off with an historical event, those subsequent generations through retelling becomes bigger and bigger, more fabulous and fantastic and more embellished. So myth is not something that isn't based in historical reality. That's not how myths work. Myth takes an event in the past, an historical event, and then embellishes it, right? Enlarges it, makes it more fantastic, more fabulous, right? That's what a myth is. But a myth is anchored in some event in history, right? And we see the mythologizing of even current figures today, like Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee lived within recent history. He did films. People knew him. And yet there are myths about Bruce Lee, legends about Bruce Lee circulating all over the world that are not true. But would you deny that Bruce Lee exists? Who can deny that? We got film footage of him, interviews of him, writings of him, photos of him. Would you deny that Bruce Lee was a martial artist? No. One of the best ever? No. The most influential martial artist in recorded history? No. So myth is not something that is based on fairy tales and fantasy. That's not what myth is. Myth is based on something that takes place at a moment in time that through subsequent generations, as it's being retold, becomes embellished, right? Enlarged. And it becomes much more fantastic, much more <clears throat> unreal, so to speak, than the actual event that took place. And I'll give you another example. Do you know it is a common fact? It's a common fact, and I'm not making it up. It's a common fact that in the world over, in continents separated by oceans, prior to internet, email, right, phones, UPS, and jets, you'll find two stories common among all these cultures in South America, right, Central America, in America, 
in Europe, in the East, Middle East, two stories. There was a worldwide flood, and the gods came down and taught humanity advanced information and sciences and cohabited with human beings. These two myths are found all over the world in ancient civilizations. They're found in the Mayan civilization, in the Aztecs, Central America, South America, in America, in Europe. How do you account for the universality of these stories by cultures that had no direct contact with one another because they're separated by oceans because these realities happened exactly like the ancient alien series on the History Channel because these events happened. But what did the people do? When these so-called gods appeared, they deceived these people to thinking they were gods and goddesses in order to mislead them from the worship of the true God. And they helped them advance in their understanding. And due to the cohabitation of these beings with humans, God was <clears throat> disgusted and appalled and flooded the earth to destroy this contaminated seed. So the very fact that the story of the flood and the story of God's cohabiting with humans and teaching them advanced information and science, the fact it's universal argues for its historicity. Argues these events took place because how do you account for the same stories popping up in the Mayan civilization, in the Aztec civilization, in C Central America, South America, North America, among even the Native Indians, in China, in Japan, in your how do you account for that? Because it happened. And as humanity spread all over the world, they took these historical events, these events that took place, they took the stories with them, and as they retold them, they embellished them, made them much more fantastic and fabulous. Everyone with me there? Everyone with me there? You got it? Yes, exactly, Jameson. Like all cultures have dragons because what they call dragons is what we call dinosaurs. Guys, be sharp. Ancient civilizations are not going to use the same words you do to describe ancient animals. What you call a dinosaur is what they would have called a dragon. You want me there? So am I being clear? So to recap the three views again. View number one, the sons of God are angels. View number two, the sons of God are the righteous seed of Adam through Seth. The Sethites, they were the seed of God, the chosen <clears throat> seed of the Lord, the righteous seed, in contrast to Cain and his corrupt seed, who had defiled themselves, due to their sin and rebellion against God. So this view would say that the seed of Seth, right? The male descendants of Seth married into the daughters of Cain. So believers, unbelievers mixed and God was upset through that union. That's the second view. The third view is it refers to human rulers, human kings, so to speak, because it would be anachronistic to speak of kings at that time, because this is before the flood. But be that as it may, it would refer to the rulers of clans who in their arrogance thought they were divine, marrying common folk. Now, why in the world would Genesis acknowledge these human rulers as sons of God marrying common folk? And where in the world do we find in Genesis or the writings of Moses that rulers were styled sons of God? I don't know. For the life of me, why? Would someone think this is what Genesis 6 is referring to? So that doesn't make sense, right? That view doesn't make sense because you have to assume that rulers call themselves sons of God early in that period of history. And you have to assume that Moses is using that expression by way of mockery, mocking them that in their arrogance, they thought they're sons of God. 
And then you have to assume, or you have to show, I should say, where in the corpus of Moses' writing do you find him quoting, or at least mockingly referring to any human ruler as a son of God? Where do you find that? Where do you find that, guys? Can you show me that? I'd like to see it. Where did you get that the rulers called themselves sons of God at that early stage of history? Number one. Number two, where do you get that Moses is actually endorsing that title or using that title by way of mocking them? How do you know that's what Moses is doing? Because we believe Moses wrote Genesis 6. Number three, can you show me anywhere else in Moses' writings, the Pentateuch, where a ruler calls himself a son of God or where Moses shows that's what the rulers thought of themselves and condemned that title? Can you show me that? See, they'll condemn the angelic view and assume their position without proving it. They'll try to put holes in the angelic view but fail miserably to prove their own. Your position doesn't win by default. Just because you refute one position doesn't make yours automatically true. Right? Second problem, or I should say, the problem with the other view, the second view, the Sethite view. Are you ready? If you're telling me that the Sethites, the descendants of Seth, son of Adam, are called sons of God because they are the chosen seed, set apart by God, that God would work through to bring about the salvation of the world, my first question would be, why are they called the sons of God in contrast to Cain and his descendants? The answer would typically be because they were righteous and Cain and his seed were corrupt and unbelieving and of the evil one. Well, you got a problem, buddy. If they're called the sons of God because they're righteous, then you're admitting they ceased to be righteous and corrupted themselves because how can they be righteous if, according to you, then they intermingle with the daughters of men, whom you say are the daughters of the line of Cain, thereby doing something evil and corrupting themselves, thereby forfeiting their status as sons of God? So I want to know how and why are they called the sons of God, according to you? Are you with me there? Now, Mike Heiser's view is that they're angels. Heiser goes with the view they're angels. So again, let me repeat. Why are the Sethites called sons of God, according to you? Did God establish a covenant through the line of Seth? You won't find it. So they can't be called sons of God for that reason. Because they were righteous and set apart in contrast to Cana's seed, who had corrupted themselves by their rebellion. Well, then you got a problem because they end up not becoming righteous because according to you, the male line of Seth corrupted and tainted themselves by marrying the daughters of Cain, thereby intermingling with unbelievers, producing a seed of unbelievers, causing God to then destroy the earth by a flood. Really? Really? So why are they called the sons of God? Because they're righteous? Well, obviously they're not righteous. And why would you assume the daughters of men, men here mean the line of Cain. Couldn't Moses have said the daughters of Cain? Why speak of men in general, siring daughters in general? Why didn't he make it specific? The sons of God married the daughters of Cain. And there'd be no argument. Or even more specific, the seed of Seth commingled with the daughters of Cain. See the problem?